So welcome to this very special event. I mean, we called it the Game Theory, the Math 308 special, the April 16 special. Um, we, uh, at suggestion of students, we are uh, we, we asked uh, uh, Professor Nash and Kuhn whether they would be willing to have a, uh, a, a, a presentation to uh, the class, and we are very, very grateful that they accept it, and uh, so this is it. Um, so, uh, as you know, as students know, we have collected questions, and uh, after, we, first we start with a little uh, a presentation by uh, 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 Harold Kuhn and uh, John Nash, and then after their presentations, uh, there will be a question answer uh, session. Uh, Sam and I will have uh, microphones with which we uh, walk around so that uh, people who have a question can have a microphone to ask the question so that everybody can hear it. And uh, well, and we'll, we'll take it until time runs out or until uh, 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 Professor National Q would like to stop. So um, that's the rules of the game. It's a game theory class, so we have to have rules. Um, so I will no longer waste any more time, and I'd like you to uh, join me in welcoming our, our guests. I thought I would start by <clears throat> giving you a little bit of history about how game theory came to find Hall. Um, Ingrid sent me last night the list of the questions that have been submitted, and there are so many that I'm going to make this historical introduction very short. Uh, let me start by asking how many of you have seen the movie A Beautiful Mind? Essentially everyone. The movie starts with a slide which is inaccurate. It says Princeton 1947. And John allegedly, according to the movie, came to Princeton in 1947. He didn't. He came in 1948. I came in 1947. <laughs> and if John had come in 1947, there was no game theory in Princeton at that time. Can everyone hear me all the way to the back? Yeah. yeah. Good. <clears throat> Literally, there was no game theory in Princeton in 1947. An eminent probabilist, Sam Carlin, who did his PhD in Princeton Mathematics Department in 1947, said he'd never heard the term before he did his PhD and went to the Rand Corporation and was a consultant there in game theory. Although the book, The Theory of Games and Economic Behavior, had been published in 1944, it had Fantastic reviews, very favorable reviews, but no research was being done. So how did that change? It came about in the following way. Uh, George Donsig, who was the father of linear programming, was working for the Air Force and developed this new theory of optimizing linear functions subject to linear inequalities. And he came to Princeton to tell von Neumann about it in the spring of 47. And uh, von Neumann was sort of interested. And he said it kind of reminded him of something he was doing, zero-sum two-person games. And nothing much came of it. But Donson came back in the fall of 47, uh, in the spring, rather, of 48, and suggested that there be a university project studying the relationship between linear programming and game theory. And uh, Donsig had to go back to Washington. He was taken to the train by the associate chairman of the department, Al Tucker, at that time. And Donsig explained what linear programming was to Tucker. And Tucker thought it was kind of interesting. It reminded him of work he'd done on Kirchhoff's laws. but. Then Tucker said, uh, I think I'd like to start this project, studying the relationship between linear programming and zero-sum two-person games. And Tucker hired two graduate students, David Gale and myself, in the summer of 1948. This is all before John came to Princeton, to study the relationship between these two subjects. And during that summer, we essentially proved that 
the mathematics of linear programming and the mathematics of zero-sum two-person games are the same. If you can solve a matrix game, you can solve a linear programming. If you can solve a linear program, you can convert it into a game and solve that. And so in the fall of 1948, when John arrived, we had started a seminar in game theory at Princeton. Now, that was kind of an important event. There were really only three or four seminars, weekly seminars, that went on either here or at the Institute for Advanced Studies. So it raised the visibility of the subject considerably. And in the period that followed that, Princeton and the Rand Corporation were the two locations in the United States where research in game theory went on. Of course, the Rand Corporation was supported by the Air Force and military applications. We were not. We were just studying the pure mathematics of game theory. And I think in that period we had a remarkable set of uh, accomplishments. I, I'm only going to put up one slide. Uh, this is a quote from Almond's article in the New Palgrave paper. <clears throat> Oh, that's legible. I'll read it out. The 1950s were a period of excitement in game theory. The discipline had broken out of its cocoon and was testing its wings. Giants walked the earth. At Princeton, John Nash laid the groundwork for two for the general non-cooperative theory and for cooperative bargaining. Lloyd, Nat, uh, Lloyd Shapley defined the value for coalitional games, initiated the theory of stochastic games, co-invented the core with D.B. Gillis, and together with John Milner, developed the first game models with a continuum of players. Harold Kuhn worked on behavior strategies and perfect recall, and Al Tucker discovered the prisoner's dilemma. This is a remarkable set of accomplishments for a short period of time and were really the foundation of the modern theory of games. And I'll let that be an introduction to my old friend and colleague sitting to my right, John Nash, who might tell you a little bit about what he did. So let me give you a microphone. Yes. Yeah. So, excuse me. Well, this one works. Am I at the right level? It, it may be too strong. Well, I'm going to put it over. Is this better? Oh, I may be. Well, I thought it. I thought maybe it might be good just to name these sort of because there's a one thing equilibrium points in n person games. This could be this could be considered as 
a mathematical result and it's essentially it's not conflicting with other things. It's like an extension of von Neumann's theory where he has the minimax and of course it turns out that uh, that is an equilibrium point. And so the first if you apply this to uh, zero sum games you, you you can infer that. This was this was uh, submitted late nineteen forty nine sent to the Proceedings of the National Academy, which nowadays doesn't have much in mathematics or physics, it's mostly biochemistry. That was sent by Professor Solomon Lefschitz, who was the chairman of the department. And then I referred to von Neumann and, and Morgenstern in that. Plus, also, I referred to David Gale, who was a student, he's sort of a uh, contemporary of Harold's here. In the, he's in the mathematics department, also important in game theory. And he had reminded me of the Kakitani fixed point theorem which is a, a neat version of the sort of the Brouwer fixed, the basic truth in the Brouwer fixed point theorem or other related things, but it has, it's been very popular with economists. So was, soon after I used the Kakatani fixed point theorem in, in here, there were economists who were using it for general equilibrium. And then I think after this, uh, the bargaining problem may have appeared. And this, this involved an axiomatic approach to uh, a classical concept of, of bargaining, uh, but um, it was set up in a mathematical form with mathematical utility, and the, the bargains available to the bargainers become a convex set of points in a plane where the coordinates are utility functions. And there is a, a, a zero point with the, if the two sides disagree, and it has the axiomatic approach. And I know you've studied that because your questions relate to that, and then you also mentioned the Kalias Marodinsky solution, and there are alternative solutions. This is it's, uh, seemed to appear. So this appeared really before my thesis. Now my thesis was written up, and it, it's on record in, in Princeton and. The Mud Library, I think. The, yeah, one copy is missing. And then the next thing is, uh, well, my thesis actually appears. But then it's called Non Cooperative Games. And this is, is much, much expanded from this. this this was really one page, but it appears on two pages in the journal. And then this appears in the, the locally favored mathematical journal called Angles and Math. something independent of that, which I can mention. It turns out that the, the game of poker is very good for illustrating uh, non-cooperative play. You could have uh, any number, two, three, five, 
poker players. It's still a quite popular game. We have some television versions of it. And I've seen it being discussed currently in, in game theory meetings there. People are working on computational studies. So a paper that was uh, uh, now, Howard mentioned uh, Lloyd Shapley. We were both, Shapley and I, we lived in the graduate college as graduate students here. And you in there too, you were also in the graduate. <laughs> I had started looking at a poker game to illustrate uh, the equilibrium point, the equilibrium concept, and uh, I, I, I did, did go to a certain extent on the computing on that, and it turned out you had quite a quite a bit of structure just in a very simplified game. Uh, to describe uh, all the possibilities. And then that had a model where there were two quantities called the bet and the ante. And that was all there was. You couldn't, couldn't bet more than once. And you had only a basic ante. But it, it, so I calculated at first with the size of bet and ante were the same. But then there was a question, well, what happens if this varies? That was one thing one could vary about the game that wasn't so difficult. And further calculations were done by uh, myself and Lloyd Shapley, who developed, while he was at Princeton, he developed the, the Shapley value concept. This very nice thing which gives the characteristic function of the game and then it gives you an evaluation giving uh, an assigned payoff value to to each player. You can argue about the evaluation or whether this or that is the right sort of evaluation, but it's nice to be able to get to have something and that is the first one. This was published in an Annals of Mathematics study volume. And were you editing that? Yes. You were editing that, that series. That was a different area of publication. Then uh, uh, the bargaining problem led also to, with, and with game theory in general, my problem leads to the possibility, suppose the situation of two persons is not so simple. And the bargaining problem, if they do not agree, then they, they don't affect one another. There's simply a zero point. But in a more general situation, they might, be in, they might be able to affect each other with, with, apart from agreement. So that led to um, what I call two-person cooperative games. Well, first, if they, if they do not agree, but they're in a general situation, they might have the possibility to do damage or to do good. Okay. So ultimately, I introduce the concept of threats. So this was a, a game that could be could be thought of in relation to bargaining in an economic context, and so is this. This is published in Econometrica. This seemed to have quite a, economic. So this was also published in Econometrica. And later on, this is John Hassani, who uh, was recognized as the 
economics, Nobel Prize at the same time as me, he discovered that an economist in working, a Danish economist working in England named Zutten, I think, had discovered the same concept for a bargaining problem solution. But it, it was not formulated quite in the same language. Like you could say that the Cournot solution, the French economists back in the, the 19th century, is the same as the non-cooperative equilibrium. It is in a technical sense, but he didn't formulate it in the generality of game theory. And so one could say the Zinjian solution, which wasn't too much noticed, was uh, not formulated in the uh, general context of game theory. He observed that the product of the profits of two uh, bilateral, two, uh, two persons in this type of duopoly, uh, a bargaining type of duopolistic situation where maybe they adjust their, their production rates, if they maximize the product of the profit, that is a, a good formula. And of course, these questions of what is the right axiomatic solution is, is still something that can be discussed. There are various arguments that might be given Fry and Nash, or, or why Kalei Samarinsky, or why Rafa, or why maybe some other variant or compounding. So this is published in Econometrica. And this opened the door for another paper, which I published in collaboration with uh, Martin Schubert, was a graduate student in the economics department here at the same time. And uh, uh, John Mayberry was in, in the mathematics department. And I got together with them, and we we applied we complied the we applied the theory of two person I, of course I was sponsoring this two person cooperative games to a duopoly problem. That's where there are two producers, they producing essentially this the same, same thing, like two dairies producing milk in the area of the same town. A comparison of treatments. This is a. Uh, um, Mayberry Nash Shirley. And Martin Schubert became <coughs> an a economics professor at Yale. He's, of course, these people are all pretty old now, <laughs> like me. Um, um, this was in econometric. Well, now I, this business about the Nobel Prize, I think there's a sort of an angle here. If, if these papers had not been published in econometric, I would wouldn't have been under consideration. This, the, mathemat the mathematics were really separable. But these, there were three things published in econometric. And then there's one other early publication. Uh, yes, but this is a simple three-person poker game. This was published in, in that special. Uh, <coughs> yes. Well, now there have been some books that have some of these. One of them is, is Princeton University Press. This is called The Essential John Nash. I don't 
I don't quite like the title of this. And this, this has some collected publications of mine, some things where I've done work as, as well as other things. It has, it has the thesis, the, the part of the, the thesis that's in the library of the university that was not in the published paper. The published paper was written in more of a mathematical style, annals of math, and this discussion about mass action and collective behavior had was sort of dropped out of it. But uh, this, this book has that. And there's also another book, uh, the, the publisher called Edward Ellegreen Company, they approached me uh, soon after I became better known, and they would do sort of a, 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 a book collecting my publications on game theory, not everything. See, this has things that are not in game theory. But there is also something called Essays on Game Theory. This has everything of the game theory type. It has the poker game, it has everything, it has this, this thesis. This is Edward Elgar. But now, after the, after the time that I was a, a graduate student at Princeton, I went on and uh, I became an instructor at MIT, and then I moved up to the ranks there. For a certain number of years, I was there. And I got into various things. Ultimately, I was in partial differential equations. But before that, uh, I was in differential geometry to some extent, and I got a, a major result, a, a classical problem, the embedding of, uh, of a Riemannian manifold in Euclidean space so that uh, the metric was induced by the metric of space. This has a vague analogy with string theory, somehow, then that you would need, you need at least 10 dimensions in order to induce a metric on a manifold of four dimensions. <laughs> That's even in the local form. But uh, for, as far as the results I was getting uh, to a closed manifold of, of four dimensions, I was uh, requiring much more than 10 dimensions. I think it came out for 40 to be 46. I was working with positive metrics, but it, it, it naturally would extend to uh, indefinite metrics like in general relativity. And then bef before that, I did something, I, I completed work on an idea that I had as a graduate student in Princeton. This became a paper called Real Algebraic Manifolds. And, uh, that was also published in the Annals of Mathematics. And that was what I was thinking could have been my thesis if the thesis in game theory was not accepted, but the thesis in game theory was accepted. And I, public, I finished writing that up at MIT, and uh, that was published. In, it was called, sometimes it's called Nash Manifolds, sometimes. And their, the work has been continued by, notably by an Italian mathematician.
sheer number and variety of the questions were already a sign of how interested uh, and, and, and the class could class learn how interested you are in game theory, they picked up some uh, uh, questions that they definitely want to see, uh, want to do first, and we'll try to do as many as we can in this time. But so um, Sam and I are going to try to go around. Some of you asked, asked many, many questions. So whenever you get the microphone, please ask one of them, and then give a chance to somebody else. So um, uh, if you, uh, the very first question, I'd like, um, I don't see him, uh, Vishal Shalani. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so um, we, in case you've forgotten your question, I actually brought a friend out. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, among other things, you really well known for doing poker. It's a sort of two-person simplification of poker. And I've uh, played poker a lot. And really, I've got a heads up, which is like a one-on-one -on -one player form of poker. And I was wondering if you take the extension of the analysis to a game with more complicated hands rather than just a high card or anything is feasible for poker. And if indeed, would it actually be useful in the real world? For instance, I know that in the results of doing poker, some of the optimal strategies are mixed strategies. And it's a discussion that I've had a lot with other people as to whether or not human beings can actually play mixed strategies randomly as they would have to be played, right? And if not, could we design a computer to do that? That could be human beings that use tells and other psychological, non mathematical things. Okay, that was a long time. I'm delighted to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm delighted to answer this question. It's very tight, but <clears throat> there was in the New Yorker magazine two or three weeks ago an article written by Alex Wilkinson. And I think the title is, What Would Jesus Play? <laughs> and the reason it's called What Would Jesus Play? Because it's describing a PhD in mathematics who is also a champion in the Las Vegas World Championship of Poker. His name is Ferguson. He has a PhD in mathematics from UCLA, and his father is a professor of mathematics at UCLA, and they've both written on game theory applied to real poker. And uh, I, I recommend this article very seriously to you, because Ferguson does apply game theory explicitly to his play, does do randomization. Now, the question of randomization in poker is a curious one, because Von Neumann and Morgenstern introduced mixed strategies, which are probability distributions over pure strategies. Uh, roughly speaking, a pure strategy is a, a book which gives you exactly what to do in every situation when you're called upon to act, and then you derive a probability distribution of um, these books. But in poker, you're at a certain situation, at a certain information set, and players generally randomize on the occasion of a choice rather than randomizing over a, the pure strategies. And you either bluff with a certain probability or you see or call or whatever on the occasion of the action. Behavior strategies, which I studied in the early 50s, work in games of perfect recall, of which poker is one. And so players intuitively reduce the dimension of their actions enormously by the, this. And you can read in the article how uh, Jesus Ferguson, he's known as Jesus, he looks a little bit like Jesus in the picture, <laughs> randomizes on the occasion of a choice. I, I, I think uh, since we have a long list of questions, I'm going to let that answer suffice. Uh, I'm quoting the article with the one thing I know is true. Very simple models, like the one that John mentioned, or the one that I did of two-person poker, show you that bluffing is absolutely necessary to get the optimal result. And that was an exciting result, to find that this psychological phenomenon really took place in a mathematical model. Okay. Oh, there. Okay. So, maybe last, uh, uh, one of my from Travis to 
to Mark. Let's have Kate's question. Kate Tackleson. My question is, is there any current research on an application of game theory that you find particularly interesting or unusual? Um, if not, what do you think is one of the more interesting or unusual applications studied in the past? Um, do you think there's some applications that are particularly interesting, or what did you find the most interesting one you've seen in the past of game theory? Well, that's a little difficult for me. I don't, I don't know everything yet, but it's being done, and I might, I might guess something. Okay. I found some uh -huh. But, but the most one interesting that you have seen, or do you want not to show any preference for all these children? <laughs> Interesting, for example, that you can reduce a traffic problem to game theory sometimes. Oh, I haven't thought of that. Optimizing traffic problems. We'll have to find a homework problem on that. Also, of course, there are experimental games. He's interested in that. Okay. Yes? For about a period of 23 years, I was a principal at a consulting firm, which was located in Princeton, called Mathematical, not related to Wolfram's Mathematica in any way, shape or form. And we did a number of applications of game theory, and I would mention uh, just one, which has always been close to my heart. Uh, we did the first theoretical contract for the arms control and disarmament agency in which we formulated inspection games. At that time, the United States and the Soviet Union were engaged in negotiations over the possibility of allowing inspections on Soviet soil, uh, the possibility of a nuclear experiment by Russia would be confused by uh, seismic activity in the Soviet Union and the strong possibility that they would try to consult experiments, you know, hide experiments by performing them in areas where there was seismic activity. And the question was how many uh, inspections a year would be sufficient in order to uh, guarantee a certain level of satisfaction and that we had discovered any experiments that they performed. And when we formulated this game, we suddenly realized that you don't want to negotiate the number of inspections for a year because you might use them up. You should have a continuing overlapping system. And um, we recommended that to the negotiators and they uh, took it to the negotiating table. But unfortunately, no treaty was ever negotiated. But it was a lovely bit of game theory. It's, reproduced in a book by Sati on mathematics of arms control, and they are called inspection games. Well, first, thanks for coming out. Um, my question is to you, Professor Nash. Um, you came of age in an era where large reliance on computing was not a major part of most um, academic research. Um, do you think in modern day that using computers to analyze and solve problems is a big advantage specifically to the field of game theory um, for large and complex games with many players where com computations by hand are not really feasible? Um, or do you think theories and principles are really all that's needed? Well, I think the computing is, is very relevant in some of the contemporary challenge. I've been working in the last so many years, um, sort of a, a later career phase, on something that specifically involves that. It's just three-person games, but it's a, a, the type of three-person property game where you could apply the shopping value, or you could apply an alternative thing called the nucleus, um, maybe other things can be applied. 
and uh, it's an attempt also to model the cooperation in terms of a non-cooperative process, regarding the idea of the evolution of cooperation, which can occur in nature. And the mind my approach to modeling brings in computation because one wants to find a certain type of equilibrium described by a large number of parameters, even though there are only three players and very simple action. But the computation is heavy and there's a curious computation of challenges that are, that are coming up. I think that the, it's really the future for you is you have uh, things become possible now that were not possible earlier. We have the four color uh, conjectures considered to solve, but that was done for computers. There's still arguments about it and how it should be done. But it seems that we wouldn't be there at all without computers. And then weather is Gradually, the weather forecast is true, and that's not our quite heavy views. And game theory is not entirely distant from weather theory, meteorology, or financial analysis. You would like to know what the stock market would do the rest of the day, maybe, or tomorrow. That's some analogous to weather prediction. But it's not easy to get that kind of thing. Let's go to the next question. course in game theory at Princeton, in fact possibly their first course in any university in game theory, and it was two years before she was born. I won't, I won't be on general <laughs> There are, there are probably more people that 
Progress has been made on that by Alman and Moshler, but there's lots of interesting questions there. I don't know whether that's a satisfactory answer or not. Neither of us is a, a, a seer of the future. In that regard. Um, I'd like to, to add uh, one of the sentences to that. I mean, he has been all done a matter of years before quantum mechanics was discovered. I mean, so I think, I think uh, statements like, this is over, we know it all, uh, should, should never be taken. Uh, for, for, certainly not for gospel. I mean, uh, uh, the interesting ideas are always the ones that come out of complete left field, and we didn't see them. I mean, that's why they're so interesting, and they can lead to completely new developments. But I shouldn't go on. I mean, next question. Oh. question for Professor Nash. Um, I read that you started off your undergraduate career leaning towards chemistry or chemical engineering. Uh, and I was wondering if there was a particular event, a particular person, or class of field in math that really got you interested in math. Um, well, I I went uh, I went to college at uh, Carnegie Tech that was in Pittsburgh, and I, I happened to have a scholarship to go there, which was uh, well, 
that definitely involved games and it also involves the modern possibilities of computation. I mean, a, a publication about that is in process, but much more could be done. I might be able to uh, get support for the work. I had a, a NSF project support for a time, and some Princeton students worked as project assistants. First there was a, someone in mathematics, then there was someone in econ economics, then another person in mathematics. I'm not working in game theory right now at all, but I uh, <coughs> have been re-examining a favorite child of mine, which is called the Hungarian method for the assignment problem, which is an algorithm I devised um, 50, 60 years ago, something like that. Uh, it was the first um, polynomial algorithm for any large class of linear programs for the transportation problem and the assignment problem. And we had a 50th birthday party in Budapest uh, four years ago. And so I had to re-examine it. And I was looking at the geometric uh, interpretation of the Hungarian method, which had been proved by a German professor, Schmidt, to be a, a greatest descent method in a certain space. And uh, I suddenly realized his choice of space and his choice of variables were very odd. And if you made different choices of space and variables, you could get very different performance for the algorithm. And you get uh, increments which are not Ejivari or Kernig increments. And so I've been exploring this in recent years, trying to get something new. I tell you, at our age, it's quite a rush to get anything new. Uh, my question is for uh, Professor Kuhn. Uh, what came first? You're interested in nonlinear optimization or you're interested in game theory? And since the two fields were still in their development 50 to 60 years ago, how, if at all, did the two fields complement each other? Um, if I go back to 1948 and 49, <coughs> Gail and Tucker and I did this basic work on duality of linear programming. And um, Tucker went off on leave to Stanford. Indeed, he was on leave while he was directing John's thesis. And he proposed to both David Gale and I that we do a paper on quadratic programming rather than linear programming. And uh, David Gale had had enough of programming and optimization and I responded saying, let's not do quadratic programming, let's do general nonlinear programming. And so we composed this paper between Princeton and uh, Stanford during the spring of uh, 1949. Uh, I was simultaneously working on my thesis, which was not in game theory or optimization, but rather was in algebra and topology under Ralph Fox. Uh, <coughs> eminent authority on knot theory. Uh, meanwhile, Tucker and I were editing the first volume of the contribution of the theory of games. So I guess it was a case of multitasking. I'm not sure that I know which influenced the other. Uh, I, optimization has been an interest all my life, but largely for combinatorial problems. Uh, Nonlinear optimization is an extremely practical subject and has gone far beyond the results of the Kuhn Tucker paper of 1949 50. Uh, I haven't done very much in that. I'm more interested in specific algorithms like the Hungarian algorithm. Thanks. Um, I can tell you that that's a field that's very, very alive. In fact, uh, I have been in the last few years working very much on trying to, to understand algorithms and get some better ones for you trainers. And we're still in the business of finding it. Um, next question is for Peter Goodmanson. 
as a lacrosse player, I find that being a theory repeater sometimes is my area of life. For example, during practice, if I dodge a certain lane, my defender uses a certain type of move, um, I'm going to a certain probability of winning. I was just wondering, this is for going through as well, if you find any real life applications in game theory in your life, and if so, how do you combat that? I, I know that game theory has been connected with um, the games on the field with politics and uh, this uh, uh, particularly the there's uh, been some discussion of the, I think in, in the soccer, uh, general, in the world football game, that you have this, this goal there, and it's a sort of a spring, and it's a goal, and there's a goal there, but it's bending. Now, where you can have attack and defense, is a natural game situation. The question could be, suppose you could, uh, Aim, you can aim the shot three ways towards the goal area, left, center, or right. How should that be done in the game part of it? When you, the idea, what you want is that the goalie is going to fail to get it and get through. This, this has been considered game theory. I, uh, I can't remember exactly the, the was, but it's uh, something where you can have a big strategy. And the idea is the goalie, if he's on one side, you can't get to the other side for the, the, the puck. Game coach has ever approached you about uh, <laughs> about strategies and things like that? A game coach? Yes. I've never been very good as a game player. I think it's zero. No, but they might have asked you about uh, your not maybe an expert player, but an expert strategy. Um, no, I don't. I don't think so. I heard sort of kind of think this is a second hand. This is a more abstract level. Um, we're near the end, but we have a, a, a question from Mohit Agarwal again. So. All right, so um, I have a two-part question. The, these questions are for both of you. Um, one would be, since you are a professor at Princeton and you happen to be the four founders of this field, um, which fundamental courses would you take as undergraduates? I know Professor Nash talked about it. I know Chris and Mark talked about the literal education, they should take classes and all of these, but if you were to be an undergraduate today, um, not just game theory, but in general, if you were an undergraduate, what would be the two, three, four, I mean, four courses you would, you would really like? And then the second part is, um, if you had one sentence for us to take away by game theory, what would it be? Some of our advice about courses, and then what would you like students to take away? Uh, it's easy to talk about courses, but I, I think I read that question. There was something about persons interested in economics and mathematics. Yeah. Because it makes a difference if you're interested in some sort of languages or cultural studies, then you could be far enough away that you would want to choose different courses. Well, what I've observed about economic, economics and economics time is that uh, it seems to help them to have mathematics and breadth. Because being an mathematician, I start from that point of view. Of one could always have more. Mathematics can't know it all. Uh, but, uh, Mathematics generally seems to be good for people who serve with economics. <coughs> Nowadays, uh, there is a crisis on Wall Street and the banks globally, 
and there, at the same time, there are these hedge funds, and uh, there's one mathematician operates a hedge fund, but he seems to be able to, to sail through the crisis times quite well, if he's, that's well hedged. But, uh, there's a category of people that we call plots, and you only need a bachelor's degree in mathematics to go to Wall Street and become a plot. Of course, you might not be hired uh, at some place, and you might be hired. But the plots seem not to have been the people who have hired recently between all the troubles have come up. They seem to have been holding their positions most of So that suggests that. The mathematics background is good. I think I'd answer, take as much <coughs> mathematics as you can. It's all beautiful. And I take combinatorics, take graph theory, take complex analysis, one of the most beautiful subjects in the world, take real analysis, take everything you can. Uh, <coughs> I had a joint chair Princeton for 38 years in economics and mathematics. And if an undergraduate came to me and asked, should I major in mathematics or economics? I want to do graduate study in economics. I'd say major in mathematics and take as much as you can, then go off and do your economics. And the mathematics will be useful. If it isn't, it's beautiful. You'll enjoy it. And, uh, take everything from symbolic logic to graph theory. Uh, as for a takeaway, you're looking at two very lucky men who were in the right place at the right time. Uh, I think game theory has clearly entered the heart of economics, no doubt about it. You can't do theoretical economics without game theory. Uh, as for other applications, I think that remains for the future. But we were lucky to be in at the beginning. Okay. On that note, we'll end. It's also almost the time of uh, the end of our class. So, so let's thank our speakers again. And